We ready? Yep. All right. So um, I think, like I said, we finished with uh, clause nine, but this has been a lot. Section eight is taking me a lot longer than I thought to get through it. We're, we're talking a little bit about everything. So I'm just gonna go over what we've gone over so far in section eight with the powers of Congress, all right? Not necessarily for discussion, uh, just to remind everybody what we're dealing with with um, Congress's authorizations. If you have questions, anything, now's the time. I mean, feel free to chime in as we're going, uh, going through them real quick. And I think, like I said, we ended with the Supreme Court. So right now, section eight, clause one, uh, we're giving, so far what we've done is we have given Congress the authority to borrow money on the credit of the United States to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with Indian tribes, which is just awesome to me. I think we need more trade with Indian tribes. Great Christmas gifts, really. Uh, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization, uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. Uh, we authorize them to coin money, regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin and fix a standard of weight and measures. Um, to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting, the securities and the current coin of the United States. We authorize them to establish post office and post roads to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, which is patent and copyright. And we ended with to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. And that's where we're at right now. And we still, we're only about halfway. Uh, we're a little more than halfway, I guess. No, we ended at halfway. There's 18 clauses here and we ended at nine. So it's taken a little while to get through. Anybody got questions? Anything you want to add uh, for what we've already gone through? Anything you wish you said that you didn't say? David, anything since you weren't here last week? No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. All right, well, we'll move on then. And we'll get to clause 10. Oh, there's Brad. All right, you must have made enough noise to trigger your uh, your mic. Good to see you. We got um, 15 of us, fair. Although, I don't know, man, I need more. Clause 10. This is gonna be the piracy and felonies clause. And we are authorizing Congress um, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas, which doesn't seem like a big deal now. However, um, you're thinking of Pirates of the Caribbean, right? We don't have we don't have pirate ships off the coast of South Carolina anymore, you know, shooting cannons at us and and uh, taking over ships. But what we do have still. Um, In Somali, right? You know, we got the Somali pirates. We still have people that are trying to take over American ships. Um, so it's still, uh, it is still somewhat, and we're going to get into that when we get into the uh, declaration of war. Something interesting that seems to be coming up, which might be a side job for me when I retire. Maybe I'll grab Brad and some other people that know how to shoot, um, shoot big guns. But we'll talk about that. Um, does anybody have anything they want to say before we get into it? Piracy and felonies? I'll just add a, uh, if I may, I'll add a definition from the dictionary here of course that, that might be useful. Uh, felony from Latin, a crime denounced capital by the law, an enormous crime. That's the definition of felony. Perfect. Um, and uh, today, the U.S. federal courts have actually, um, piracy now includes acts committed on the high seas other than robbery. Um, they include robbery. Hey, Jim. But, yeah. So it is Christmas still, it is still half. <laughs> I had my work Zoom meeting today. Oh, so it. it, it is still happening though, because I have friends that have a yacht that, and they're based in Miami mm -hmm. and we just had this conversation last week that pirates the pirates are still there they do different routes and everything because there are still pirates oh sure so there are. it's still there are. happening 
There are, I guess what I was saying, I guess I, I, I misspoke. I mean, it, if you're out there and you're looking for the Jolly Roger flying on a big sloop, you know, no. big ship, a big high masted ship, you're not going to have that, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there are, especially as soon as you get offshore, um, from these different countries, I don't know. I don't know how many pirates are, are U S bred pirates, but, uh, but yeah, piracy is definitely happening still. Um, uh, like I said, the courts today, piracy includes acts committed on the high seas other than robbery. So what they're saying basically is that an unsuccessful attempt to rob a ship on the high seas is going to fall under the statute. But because before, and what was the definition? Um, piracies and felonies. David gave us the definition there, but uh, it, it was pretty limited when they came out with this thing. Right now, I think it's it's pretty hard to commit any felony out there on the high seas and not be charged. Um, Uh, we added this to the Constitution again because of the, uh, because, uh, I, I believe it's probably Article 9 um, of the Articles of Confederation, but it was, you know, all the states were allowed to prosecute differently, and it, it's just more uniformity. It's just why it was added. We already had it with the Articles of Confederation. It just became more uniform under the Constitution. Um, Okay, it's defined as, in my notes here, I got it written down, that is defined as murder or robbery on the high seas or any other crime punishable by death if committed on land. That's what they're looking for. However, now, like I said, with the federal courts, the federal courts have ruled um, that basically an unsuccessful attempt to rob a ship in the high seas would fall, um, would fall under that statute, which is why these merchant vessels are allowed to protect themselves now, right? They don't have to wait for somebody to rob them. Um, questions? Dave, anything to add? So, nope. Yep. I could be getting ahead, but it says offenses against the law of nations. Is that defined somewhere? Where are we at? Well, yeah, no, we are going to get to that. Uh, okay. That's still going to be in the tenth clause. Um, right. I'm, uh, I'm kind of splitting it up here. Gotcha. Right. Sorry. I, guess I should read the whole thing. No, no worries. No worries. Um, yeah. So, what she's talking about is the other half of this is. Um, uh, they have the power to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. And I don't have, you know, I thought I had the law of na the whole thing with the law of nations. I don't know how I don't have that. I thought I had it in my notes. Dave, anything? No. I know I got I got nothing there. David, Sorry. David's punched out of the piracy act here. He's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, David, okay. I think you touched on the definitions there. Um, I think felony in general was essentially capital type punishments back in that time in general. Um, I know the definitions of felony has changed significantly over time, but um, I'm not 100% sure with the way you read that. It almost sounded like it was capital punishments were like all felonies back then. Well, I think that I think that that's implied in the definition of of felony um, that it is a serious crime worthy of capital punishment. I did get that out of that too. Yeah, it seemed to imply that. Well, and that's I mean that was that is their definition, right? Is that any uh, any crime punishable by death if committed on land? So right, and I know frequently pi pirates were hung. I mean that was. Uh, in everywhere, that was a considerable crime. They weren't real nice people, despite what the movies. They weren't all Johnny Depp. Yeah. All right. So the law against uh, offenses against the law of nations encompasses three subjects. There's piracies, felonies committed on the high seas, and offenses against the law of nations. Now, I'm not seeing exactly what the law of nations. Somebody Google that for me, real quick. Um, I guess I glossed over it because I'm only worried about what um, what it affects with us. Uh, piracy, though, however, it says is the only universal crime contrary to the law of nations, uh, which is why um, why we're dealing with it here. Uh, just on it, on, just on its face, and being as part of that clause, I would say that. Um, that is just making sure that it's in agreement with the law of other nations, which I'm sure also have laws against piracy as well. I, know, I cannot believe I didn't. Uh... It, 
it's curious that it's on the high seas, that it's not on U.S. waters, that it's not, it just. Well, we want to protect our interests is what it is. You know, it's just like, it's the same thing. We, these merchant ships, oh, there's my squeaky chair, sorry. Uh, it's these <laughs> merchant, you know, we got these merchant ships out there um, right. and getting attacked by Somali pirates. We should be able to defend and we should be able to bring those pirates back and, and prosecute them if we catch them, if we don't blow them up and kill them out there on the, uh, on the high so seas. The so the principles of laws and nations or nations of sovereigns and it was in 1883 so it says um let me see where it says so yeah it was done in 1883 well it had to be done before that because it's in the constitution so they must have changed something in 1883 so what I found on um, Cornell's uh, law school's website on the origin of the clause that under the Articles of Confederation, it was given exclusive power to appoint courts for the trial of piracies and felonies committed on the high seas, but no provision was made for dealing with offenses against the law of nations. The draft of the Constitution submitted to the con uh, convention in 1787 by its committee of detail empowered Congress to declare the law and punishment of piracies and fel felonies committed on the high seas and the punishment of counterfeiting the coin of the United States and of offenses against the law of the nation. In the debate on the floor of the convention, the discussion turned on the question as to whether the terms felonies and the law of nations were sufficiently precise to be generally understood. The view that these terms were often so vague and indefinite as to require definition eventually prevailed and Congress was authorized to define as well as punish piracies, felonies, and offenses against the laws of nations. Um, I see a whole lot of people talking about the law of nations, but nobody is saying what the law of nations actually is. I'm well, I'm trying to get- Everybody to likes it. saying the word, not just you. I mean, apparently Cornell, everybody likes saying law of laws of nations, but you know- well, everybody remember, reads that Keep in mind, I think, you know, looking at the copy that I have that represents the capitalization of words and I think we talked about this in our first session. Oftentimes they capitalized words back then that they thought were significant. Like I see other words like bills and cases and votes capitalized. And they're not describing necessarily a particular thing, but a concept or an idea. And so law of nations, there may not be a bound set of laws that may be referring to any laws of nations that may be applicable. You know, that's probably right. Dan, uh, uh, Dan Griffin says that law of nations are defined as customary international laws, which is exactly what you're saying right now. Yeah. Right. I, I think, I think Renee hit a home run with that analysis there, that that's what they were struggling with was how do, just like in all the things we've talked about before, how do we define these things and, and who do we give control over them? You know, I guess my problem is being in, law enforcement for 27 years when you say law of nations i'm expecting a codified ordinance book of the law of nations i want to see what these laws right. are but what you got is just what you got is disorderly conduct yeah exactly <laughs> exactly no that's probably about right mm -hmm. right yeah i i kind of look at this as kind of like a un type deal where it, the un can get together and just sanction for anything at any time yep. and it's kind of dependent upon the times you're living in and it's yeah, I like that disorderly conduct. Right, and in, yeah. a, in a in a U.S. court, could you be charged with something that's a crime and enough to another nation? You know, what I mean, could they throw a charge at you and say, "Well, this is also illegal over there"? I mean, if you know, if we're gonna go with the disorderly conduct thing, then we can go with piling on, you know, throwing the book at them. Oxford Dictionary says the law of nations is international law. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Way to be vague. <laughs> Thank you for clearing that up. <laughs> I thought you couldn't use the word in its own definition. <laughs> I think it's just so, Alicia. I hope that I hope that clears it up for you nicely. I hope you completely understand exactly yeah. what we're okay. Good meeting. I'll see you guys next week. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, in fairness, I don't think we're going to have to deal with piracy very much. I mean, it's good to know that. Uh, that that we give Congress the uh, the authority to act on it. I mean, Ohio, I don't know. I guess we could have piracy on the Great Lakes. Good luck. It's not a big Me escape too. route there, though. Just shut the locks down. All right, moving on. 
All right, clause 11. And this one's, I, I've always been interested in this, um, 11, 12, and 13, uh, because it has to do with the military. I'm sure Brad's fairly interested in this. Uh, so what we give Congress here is uh, the power to declare war. This is me. I watched it. <laughs> there we go. We, we got Michelle yelling at uh, yelling at her. Are we good? Is there going to be a domestic? Order? Should I come over there? Let me get to this. Hold on. <laughs> Let me put my stuff on. Um, all right. So I'm going to break this up. I'm going to break 11 up a little bit, and we're going to I'm going to just go with um, um, declaring war right now. We've got other clauses in in 11. Uh, the market reprisal clause. We got captures clause, and we'll go over each one of those. Um, but the very first part of um, clause 11 that they have the uh, power to declare war, which is pretty awesome. Um, uh, this is one of the big checks and balances that they were worried about um, when they made the Constitution. Now, don't be confused. Although, you know what? Let me let me start out with a quote here from Rand Paul, on September nineteenth, two thousand seventeen. What Rand Paul says, and this is obviously everybody's problem with this is what we have today is basically unlimited war. War anywhere, anytime, any place on the globe. I don't think anyone with an ounce of intellectual honesty believes these authorizations allow current wars we fight in seven countries. And I would agree with him. Um, if you look at um, how many times the president has taken us to war without an authorization from Congress? It's ridiculous. Now, um, I think it's 60 days that he can act uh, without them. But uh, I mean, you look at Kosovo, you look at, um, I mean, where's, where's my list at? I had a list up. Um, I mean, I'm sure everybody can come up with their own. Um, where we have not declared war. Now, this does not stop the president. It does not um, tie the president's hands in defending us, right? The, the president of the United States can always defend us. When we're attacked, he can defend us. Um, you look at Pearl Harbor, um, you look at 9-11, the president is certainly allowed to defend us. Now, 9-11 was a little different because we didn't know exactly who, who the, um, oh, sorry, my chair squeaked. I totally lost my train of thought again. We didn't know who our enemy was there on 9-11 right away. Right? We assumed it was Muslim. Um, we assumed it was terrorists, but we didn't know. It's not like you know, Pearl Harbor, we knew who the enemy was. right? We had Japanese zeros flying over, sinking our ships. But the president certainly has a right to defend himself. He doesn't need the declaration to do that. He doesn't need Congress's, uh, he doesn't need their blessing to defend, um, to defend the country. And we'll get into that with um, Article 2. Um, a declaration of war is not the actual check in the check and balances, right? Um, other than David, because I'm sure he's going to know. Um, where does the check come from? Nobody? Checks and balances. Where does Congress check the executive... Um, the executive branch's warmongering. Um, what does Congress control? Finances. Finance. Correct. Right. So the president can de declare war all he wants, but if he doesn't have any money to do it, it's going to be a short lived war. Um, so what the declaration actually does, because the declaration is not a check, but what it does is it gives legal notice of war so that any nation, enemy nations possibly make amends, right? Um, it also serves notice on the enemy's allies that uh, they're gonna be considered, and I love this word, they're gonna be considered co-belligerents. I think I'm gonna start using that when I work, go to bar fights or whatever. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell people, I'm gonna go, you're under arrest, you're co-belligerent. It's, <laughs> it's fantastic. It's totally I'm gonna try to use that at least once a week. Uh, that, sound, that sounds usable. But uh, do, co, you're a co-belligerent. That sounds right. horrible, right? You right. think you're going to prison. 
It's a 25 oh. cent word for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a little, maybe more. Maybe I, I, more. I, I might give you two good quarters for that. I like the <laughs> PhD version of uh, disorderly conduct. Yeah, right, right. The, the co belligerent. <laughs> um, and it also notifies them their shipping would be subject to capture, um, the, the allies and the enemy. Um, and it also lets your own citizens know that they cannot be aiding and abetting that enemy, right? Uh, once that war is declared, you can't, we, World War II, um, you, you can't be over there aiding the Japanese. You can't be, um, well, we'll get into internment camps here soon. Um, so that's what, that's what the declaration does. The declaration is not, um, like the president, I guess, can launch hostilities on whoever he wants. I mean, he can't, he has been, but he's not gonna get real far when, the, when, the, when Congress does not fund that war, when Congress does not give him any money to do it. That's where the true check is gonna come in. Dave, I'm sure you have something to say. Uh, yeah, I just I just typed in a definition into the chat if anybody would like to read it because the definition of war from this time is very interesting. And for those that aren't viewing the chat, I'll just read it briefly if I may. War may be defined as the exercise of violence under foreign command against withstanders, force, authority, and resistance being the essential parts thereof. Violence, limited by authority, is sufficiently distinguished from robbery and the like outrages Yet consisting in relation towards others, it necessarily requires a supposition of resistance, whereby the force of war becomes different from the violence inflicted upon slaves or yielding malefactors. All right. So I, there, go, you know, I, I mean, do we disagree with any of that even today, though? I mean, that sounds pretty, sounds pretty legit for a definition of war to me. Right. I think I think that's pretty thorough. Just so that if any, you know. It's one thing to say war, but what is the actual, what was the definition they were thinking of? You know, there you have it. So if, if you look it up, it'll say that, that we have, uh, that Congress has, we've declared war uh, five times, right? But they're talking about five conflicts. Um, and I'd have to go through and find out exactly what they are. I know the War of 1812 is one. Uh, you got World War One and II. Um, I don't think there was, I don't think 1812 Korea. was 1812 one of them. Yep. Yeah. 1812 is definitely one of them. Yep. Um, however, it's actually been 11 times that Congress has declared war um, because you've got to count every nation that we've declared war against. Um, so we've declared war 11 times against 10 countries in five conflicts, right? World War II, we were declaring war on everybody. Um, Italy, we're, we're putting notice out there to everybody that we are now at war with them. It wasn't just Japan. It wasn't just Germany. It was Italy. It was um, who else? Who else? Dave, help me out there. Um, Germany, Japan, and Italy were the primary. You get you get the idea. So, powers, yeah. Mexico, Spain, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Japan, Germany again, Italy, Bulgaria. And again, you got to uh, remember. I mean, you're, what the declaration is, right? We're in World War Two. I mean, we're obviously fighting, fighting the right. uh, the Axis, but we were given legal notice. I think it's important too that you give legal notice to to the enemy's uh, allies and say, "Hey, look, here's a deal. <laughs> you're either with them or you're with us. One of the two. Um, so, uh, real quick, I was talking about all the times that we have not. Um, I'm just going to read it real quick. So, what you have is a war powers resolution in 1973. And what that does is limits the president's ability to engage U.S. forces in hostile action um, longer than 60 days <coughs> without a uh, declaration of war or, or a congressional authorization. Um, so we've got, uh, in modern times, you got President Carter, right, when he went in there to try to rescue the Iranian hostages. President Ronald Reagan unilaterally dispatched American forces to Lebanon, Grenada, Libya, and the Persian Gulf. Before Desert Storm, George H.W. Bush publicly declared that he had constitutional power to initiate war unilaterally, an authorization from Congress, which he barely received. 
President Clinton followed these precedents in Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, and the Middle East, Kosovo. Um, President George Bush asked for and received congressional approval for wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, but um, President Obama unilaterally ordered a limited intervention in the Libyan civil, civil war, if you remember that in 2011 um, with Muammar Gaddafi, on the ground um, that the intervention did not involve sustained hostilities, but uh, did not include ground troops, was part of a multi multilateral coalition to implement a UN Security Council resolution, and the hostilities were too small to constitute a war under the Constitution. So I guess there we fall under the definition of war that David just gave us. But you can see how many times that the president has used the United States military without any authorization from Congress. Um, and almost in all those, at least the ones that I am old enough while I was in the military, I know we're challenged. I mean, anytime he's going to send troops in, it's always um, it's always going to be challenged, uh, just because you're, you're subverting Congress. Anything? Questions on the declaration of war? I got a Fred, lot. You got anything? <laughs> just. <laughs> I mean, all I can do is laugh. Like, I, there's not another reaction. Like, we haven't declared war since 1942. On another uh, well, is that right? Because, yeah. well, he got, we did not declare, but he did get congressional approval. Bush got uh, approval for the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Yeah. Congress so, hasn't declared war. Yeah, Congress has not declared war since 1942. And it's like, well, I guess that's probably, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, here we are. How many years, Brad? 2001, we're at 19 and counting. 19 years of fighting with no declaration of war. And how uh, many trillions? All the trillions. All the trillions. All of them. How many deaths? Uh, you know? Too many. Gotta, yeah, How many deaths in 19 that. years? How many American deaths? How many innocents over there? We got to be over 5,000 US soldier deaths. I mean, it's just, and with no declaration of war. So I don't understand. Somebody explain to me how this is I still just going on. Back up a minute. So there was no war declared by Congress for the Korean War, for the Vietnam War? Nope. Nope. Conflict. Not since World War II. Well, now, Vietnam, they did have a resolution. They had the, the uh, I think it was Gulf of Tonkin, right? The resolution there that authorized troops to go in, but there was no declaration. There's got to be something for Korea because when my husband served over there, he came back a veteran of foreign wars. My father was a veteran of a foreign war considering well, we, were, we were there during war but the united states never declared war right we were there in support of, in support of our allies oh so dan and joanna griffin noted that they were listed as military action which the president has the authority to do right but it's not congress declaring war um and this is i mean this is a thing that blows my mind like how can we declare a draft? Like, how are we going to institute a draft when Congress hasn't declared war and take people that haven't had their voice heard by their representatives approving a war? This is the thing that is among the most frustrating to me because I know- Well, the draft is still, I mean, I think it was 73, right? 73 is when they, I think they stopped the draft in 73. Um, yeah, something, something wrong. Obviously, obviously there's talk, talk, there's talk. But our young that. men still have to register. Select for selective service, correct? Yes. And I don't even think it's young men anymore, right? I think it's everybody. It, no, it's, it's still young just men. the men. Oh, it is just the men. That's another for conversation. any another college day. kid to get for a guy that's going to college to get FAFSA, they automatically have to register for the draft. It's an issue. Um, even they tell all the kids in high school whether they're going to college or not that they need to register for the selective service. They remind well, they all the boys before they turn 18. Well, and when, let me see. Go ahead. Talk amongst yourselves. Let we just see. did it for my daughter's boyfriend. For yeah. him to do FAFSA and to be able to get any money from the government, he has to register. I and didn't know that was mandatory for the FAFSA. I thought it was just mandatory across the board. They I didn't know that, Brandon. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I, think the, I think the FAFSA is one instance where they specifically ask and or check. Gotcha, David. Well, they'll do it for you. You can select, they'll do it for you. Or you have to do it before they approve your FAFSA. Wow. Gotcha. Yeah, either way, you bet you have to do it. Or no money. See, and I, di- I didn't realize that. So that's just another instance of the federal government coercing people or states into doing things um, if, if you want the money. Yep. No when sign, about, no loan. And we mm-hmm. talked about some of those. Wow. We talked about some of those court cases on that. Um, I just don't understand. I don't know, man. I guess I just don't understand why some of the stuff's not being challenged. Yeah, the draft. You may be prosecuted and face a fine of up to 250000 and or jail time of up to five years if you yeah. fail to register for the draft and you're required to. But there is no draft. You're registering for selective service. I get that, but there is no draft right now. Right. But yeah, so, it just, it's, a, it's a whole thing to shit show. And if you don't, you're, they're not going to give you enough money to go to. High five, Brad. Whole thing's a shit show. Yep. So you're doing it. You're doing it. Or else. (laughs) Disgusting. Uh, Listen, man, I got a shirt that says uh, my love. uh, I have a love of country, not love of government. Uh, I am loyal to the country. I am government. And, And things like this are exactly why. It's such a broken. You know, and when you look at, man, if you look at just regular people that are looking to run, how do you even begin to, it is so, the government is so huge, such a Leviathan, and just eating yes. itself and eating the states and it eats and destroys everything it touches. How do you fix this? Where do you start? By studying the constitution. Well, okay. <laughs> um, there well, you that's go. great. That's great. But where right. do you start to Let's fix go. what's going on? We just need more. The, pro- the problem is, is, is you start at the ground level, but as soon as you start getting too big, then the powers that be, whoever they are, that don't want you in, will make sure it doesn't happen. Well, I think, I'll unless you have a big I'll enough. My own question. Group. I think where you start is an article five convention. That's where you start. And we figure out what's important to us. And I think one of the things that gets the ball seriously rolling on fixing all this, the very first thing are term limits for these congressmen. We get these guys out that have been there for 47 years and not done anything but pork. Oh yeah. And we'll talk at the end if we have time about this, this COVID relief bill. (laughs) <laughs> oh, this is a joke. Sorry. Absolutely oh, disgusting. Funny. It is absolutely. Yeah, after the after party. I'm bringing us back back around. Let's go. <laughs> well, no, no, but uh, but I did. I did when I uh, put that post up. I said we're going to talk about and maybe the COVID relief bill. So I did say that we we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, absolutely disgusting. I may, I'll point out that that on its face, uh, this clause in Section Eight. I don't think there's any debate that that was properly assigned to Congress at the time. And when this was written, that's exactly where they put that power. And so that was their intention, that it was the Congress shall have power to declare war, uh, define and punish piracy, you know, all these things. Those, those powers were properly put in the Congress. And where we have the disconnection now is that we have things that sound to us as though they are war taking place that seem to fit the definition of war and yet have not gone through this process. And, and they seem to do a decent job of it for 200 years where when there was a war, they declared war generally. But right. For about I'll, I'll, I'll make an, I'll make one, just one illustration to take us out of this, hopefully why this is important. If, if you recall uh, your history during the beginning of the second world war, the United States was having to decide whether or not we were going to aid Britain. And could we? What could we supply them with and not violate international law? If we were aiding and abetting, weren't we an ally? And they had to be very careful with lend lease what they could sell, what they could give them. They gave them some things so there was no sale. And they had to be very careful because they had not declared war and the isolationists were still arguing that we should just avoid conflict altogether. 
So, you know, once upon a time, even as late as World War II, it was a big deal, you know, to, for a nation to, to go to war, even in a situation that dire, in a conflict that huge, with those larger things at stake, the declaration of war made, made a difference. It, it was important. And uh, I think that's how they intended it. You know, this is, this is one of those things that's a little hard. When I started this thing, I didn't want to bounce around the Constitution. It was just, I think it was going to be too hard to go from Article 1 one week to Article 3 the next week um, uh, to, you know, Article 2, back to Article 3. But this is one of those things that I kind of wish we had jumped because Article 2 gives the president a whole lot of power when it comes to this stuff. And once we get to Article 2, you're going to look back on this, and you're going to be like, all right, I get some of it, right? I think the president is certainly within his rights if he wants to commit troops to, um, you know, peacekeeping missions. If he wants to commit troops to, um, whether you agree with it or not, I mean, I, I know the, uh, the thoughts on civil wars, right? Like in Syria, like in Libya. Look, man, that's not our, that's not our business, right? You, you don't get involved in two brothers fighting. Let them fight it out. Let them let them figure out their own their own way to go, their own course of action. However, we are the world's policemen, like it or not, we are. And when you have something like Syria, where the people there are being killed and abused, and I think somebody has to step in to help those people, and the president has the right to do that. I think, um, as long as it's not a long term, you know, it's it's not our war. If we're just there helping them out, I don't know if I have a problem with that. Um, constitutionally, I don't know if I have a problem with that. Um, it's, it becomes a slippery slope, right? Because like it is, it is. The, the Korean War is, you know, the perfect example. We get all these, you know, there's some aggression, brothers fighting, and then you know, China's coming in, Russia's coming in. Um, so we go help the, the UN. It's not our war. We go in with the U, the United Nations, and all of a sudden, you know, right. thousands but and thousands think, and thousands of our I guys. I think, like Jim dead. said some of these things will be easy to reflect backwards on when we find the other half of the the uh, powers to uh, send military. Right now, we're just reading this and thinking of all kinds of instances where this didn't apply. And when we get farther along, we'll be able to reflect back on this one and see how the two mesh. Well, I yeah. guess too, you know, my biggest problem with this whole thing is 19 years of clearly war. We have every resource, every military resource has been in the Middle East for 19 years and there's no declaration of war. I mean, War Powers Act lets them do things for 60 days, two months, 19 years. I think it, I think it equates a lot to, uh, to back when they wrote the Constitution, if you, if you substitute the word terrorist for pirates, they're not, they're not technically sponsored by a country, you can't declare war on, oh, it's a war on pirates, right? So th they're kind of stuck in that limbo. You know, you kind of know what part of the world they're hiding out in, but they, by all official uh, rules of engagement, they aren't, it's, it's not the country of Afghanistan or the country of Iraq, they're, they're hiding out there from even supposedly that uh, government. But I guess, well, again, we have been off. You know what? That's actually a good point, I guess. That is actually a good point. We are not at war with Afghanistan. We are not at war with Iraq, right? We are at war with those that would do us harm. I guess the question is going to be, after 9-11, I don't think anybody's arguing that once Bush figured out that Al-Qaeda was behind this thing, that we, he had the right to go after them. Mm -hmm. right? we, he's got 60 days at least full power and might of the United States military to go back and avenge the attack against our country. I got no problem with that. But at what point does it stop? Now, they did authorize, I mean, he's got a, you know, um, Obama's got an authorization for Afghanistan and Iraq, but at what point does it, I mean, yeah. we've, everybody said it before, what's the end game? And why are we allowing this to go on? I mean, it's just time to bring everybody home. Cut ties, bring them home. Well, what about when, when we toppled Saddam? We went into Iraq. That was that should have been one of those where I would have bet a hundred bucks we had a declaration of war for that. But were we? we well, yeah. I mean, well, well, some of that, some of that was pursuant to United Nations Security Council resolutions, of which we're the strong arm. 
And so those, when they uh, had drilled into Kuwait and then attacked Kuwait, some of that was pursuant to United Nations Security Council resolutions, which they were told if they didn't obey, they would be attacked. Okay, and so, it's a, so it's the centralized banks, the Federal Reserve and the military industrial complex. Figured it out. <laughs> yeah. Follow the money. Right. I mean, nothing makes money like a war. But, uh, Even you know, depending on what you believe, too, with Iraq, I mean, we may have been misled um, sending troops in there. Well, this so, all goes back to what you were saying, Jim. We've what's been at war 19 years. So if we got rid of, the, if these congressmen weren't making money off this, the industrial complex well, sure. and all that, that could be a big problem solver. Sure. Well, obvious, right? I'd like to know how many of these congressmen are getting uh, some kind of kickback from Raytheon, mm -hmm. right? From I mean, remember uh, who was the contractor? Black was it Black? Halliburton. Black oh, Halliburton. Halliburton. You're right. Halliburton. You're right. Halliburton. I mean, that's exactly it. Why in the war when they're they're lining their pockets? Yeah, you know, make a lot of our. Dick Cheney had a big uh, part of Halliburton. Yep. Yeah. So that wasn't yeah. even it wasn't even the lobbyist. That was a uh, conflict of interest. Right. I mean, I mean with the lobbyists, they're all getting kickbacks. Yeah. I mean, it's happened. Very defenses that have worked for Raytheon or Boeing or, you know. You know what stops kickbacks? Term limits. Term limits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Public, public executions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, defining people as traitors. That, that'll do it. All right, so moving on. So into um, let's get into the market reprisal section, uh, or market reprisal reprisal mark and reprisal clause. Still in clause eleven. Um, this is not used anymore, but there's a little something interesting here. Um, back when the Constitution was written, we granted uh, gave them authority to grant letters of mark and reprisal, which are both the same. They both mean the same thing, uh, really. Just mark is a uh, French word. So. What we did back in the day, we authorized privateers, uh, private people, to go out there and seize enemy ships. And they could bring those enemy ships back and then petition once they bring these ships back. And most of the time, they were given those ships to do whatever they wanted. They wanted to sell them. They wanted to, to use them. They could do whatever they wanted. And as long as they had that letter of mark um, and reprisal, they were basically free to go out and do whatever they wanted to do. Um, Anybody know what another word for privateer probably is? Privateer is like a, a government supported pirate. Pirate, right. That's exactly what it is, right? So if we go back to, uh, to the piracy clause, I mean, all these people should be put to death, but they're not because they have a letter of mark and reprisal from the United States government. Um, State sponsored terrorism. <laughs> would the letter of market reprisal be specific to a particular ship per, per se like you, you know hey like they bounty? committed a crime like a bounty right, hunter like a bounty. yes i don't know um so it's okay to be a pirate as long as you're doing it on behalf of the government right. isn't that always the way it is isn't that always the way it is i mean if that's if that's distasteful you could just say uh you're a mercenary yeah, it's the same right. with the contractors. It's the same with the contractors in the sandbox. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you went over there and did what the contractors are doing, you'd be brought up on charges. But you got that letter in your pocket from the military saying, "That's ah, all right. Go on over there and kill as many people as you want." It's who okay. you know. It's who you know. Now, what's kind of cool, and I don't know if I mean. I, I, all I know is there's been calls for it, but I don't know who's making these calls, right? It, it could just be crazy people. I have no idea. But uh, with the piracy that's going on now, um, or US flagships overseas, um, it's led for some calls to bring back the market repri reprisal clause. Uh, and that's what I was saying would be a pretty cool side job, right? If I could retire, grab Brad, maybe uh, Dan, you know, anybody knows how to use a 50 cal, we could just buy a boat and we could just go out there with our letter of market reprisal and we seize all these Somali ships. It'd be awesome. And it right? sounds like this. It sounds like this. 
Exactly. <laughs> no trouble. They'd be like, the Coast Guard pull up, like, what are you doing? I'm like, bro, I got a, I got a letter of market reprisal. I'm, like, oh, I'm sorry, carry on, sir. And then we would seize the Coast Guard boat. <laughs> They'd be like, you can't get on my boat. I'm like, bro. Government says, <laughs> government says I'm, I'm legal. So yeah, I don't, I don't know how serious that is, but I, I saw that and I thought that was kind of funny. It'd be kind of neat, man. Just get me, Brad, a couple guys. We just grab a bottle of bourbon, jump on a Bayliner trophy, head out there with a couple AR-15s and take on the pirates. You might That'd need a fun. barrel. Yeah, barrel. Maybe a barrel. <laughs> maybe, a barrel. <laughs> maybe a barrel. Actually, no. You know what's going to happen. We're going to jump on that Bayliner trophy with a barrel of bourbon. We're going to make it about two miles offshore. Coast Guard's going to find us just floating out there all passed out on the boat. <laughs> That's why, that's we why can still just show them the letter and be like, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> we're still good. Right. Now, now you're under arrest. For a <laughs> you're under arrest for operating this vessel under the influence. No, uh, bro. No, we're not. Me. And not only that, but give us your vote. He's like, God well, damn it. What's your 50 cent word? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We're going to be co belligerents. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> All right. So moving on. So anyway, market reprisal, not used anymore. It's basically been struck down. However, the captures clause is the very last part of uh, clause 11. We give Congress the power to make rules concerning captures on land and water. So um, the way the framers understood this, um, it appears that they understood this to be related strictly to property. Um, there's been talk ever since then of whether or not it has to do with troops. Um, um, let's see here. I have highlighted here. The roots of the capture clause can be traced back to Article 9 of the Articles of Confederation, which vested in Congress. Now, you got to remember, this is where this came from, was the Articles of Confederation. So this, this is really telling you what their frame of mind was when they added this. Um, it vested Congress the power of establishing rules for deciding in all cases what captures on land or water shall be legal and in what manner prizes taken by land or naval forces in the service of the United States shall be divided or appropriated. With that right there, um, with that article in the Articles of Confederation, I mean, clearly you cannot, or at least you should not, uh, be dividing or appropriating people, right? Um, so clearly, I think that they were, this was all about property. Um, Dave, anything on this before I move on? I agree. And uh, let me just read the definition of reprisal, which is, um, it's kind of scary when you think of the, of the idea of a government saying this, but reprisal, something seized by way of retaliation for robbery or injury. So it's a justifiable seizure in retaliation for a previous robbery or injury. So I think it was the Barbary Coast Pirates that they actually went after at, at one point and uh, raided them. So uh, what they're talking about here is, yeah, they took, uh, they took somebody's stuff off of a ship. We have the power to go take it back. And then some, or just that? Well, I, I don't know what the limitation would be, a letter of reprisal reprisal specifically referring to the, the definition says something. Well, so now keep in mind though, this is, this is not a, a standalone clause. This is the right. last part of the, uh, of the war, uh, of them declaring war. So right. this, this is, it's not like we can just go out there and start capturing people's property. Um, right, in retaliation for something seized, so. That's it. War to be So no pillaging. I don't know no. why I, I don't know why I highlight. What's that? No pillaging or plundering. You can only take back what got stolen in the first place. Uh, not if I have a letter of mark or reprisal. Well, would this be kind of like uh, us just claiming land after war? It saying, could hey, be. Yeah. It could be. We're going right, to put right. a base here in Germany to prevent further aggression. Sure. Yeah. You know, absolutely. And I think that was the well. And, you got to remember navies, man. Navies back then were a big, I mean, a lot bigger than they are now. I mean, a lot of wars were fought on the, on the oceans, right? Um, and 
uh, the original understanding of the clause appears to be that Congress alone has the power to establish rules governing the circumstances under which wartime captures generally enemy ships or vessels aiding the enemy and their valuable goods will be um, adjudged lawful prizes to which the captors are entitled to at least partial title. So right, I think there you go. Yeah. I think a, a lot of this had to do with shipping and with with warships, mm -hmm. not so much with the land and but the way yeah, it's written about capturing boats. It on. does say, but it does say captures on land or water. So right, yep. That is pillaging and plundering. It is, there is some pillaging and <laughs> plundering happening here. There is. I have something highlighted here, and I don't know why because I'm reading it now, and it doesn't even make sense to me. Um, but I highlighted it. So lay it on us. All right, well, I'll just lay it on you and I'll let you guys figure it out. <laughs> so it's a paragraph and it says, in recent cases arising from the war on terror, the court has generally avoided discussion of the captures clause. Its only reference comes in uh, Hamden versus Rumsfeld, 2006, where the court referred to the captures clause as an example of congressional powers distinct from the president's powers in executing war but did not clarify the powers included in the captures clause. Furthermore, five members of the court found the detention of enemy combatants. Oh, maybe this is why I did it. Found the detention of enemy combatants for the duration of the conflict to be so fundamental and accepted an incident to war as to be an exercise in the necessary and appropriate force Congress has authorized the president to use without clarifying whether Congress even needed to authorize the president to execute his war powers in areas so fundamental and accepted. That's probably why I did it because we're talking about people again. Um, and it was probably brought up as to whether or not seizing people um, are legal under the captures clause. Yeah, that's very, very applicable. What does captures include? But there's so much else you know, the G Geneva Conventions that dictate how prisoner of wars have to, uh, prisoners of war have to be treated, um, what you're allowed to do with prisoner of wars, prisoners of war. Um, well, that, uh, that, just, um, that just defines the treatment of them. It doesn't define whether they can be captured. Right, right, right. So somebody obviously had brought up the, the, the point that they don't think that we were even allowed to, to capture them since this is clearly about property. But the court... And you know what I just read there, the court is refusing to even talk about um, the powers under the captures clause. They're just basically saying that, look, POWs are not gonna fall under that and it is um, fundamentally accepted an incident to war, so. Based on this, yeah. we can hold these guys for 19 years since we've been in conflict for 19 years until it's over. What, what was the first part of that? Based on of that clause you were reading, um, based on the Supreme Court case, uh, we could essentially hold these prisoners throughout the whole 19 years that we've been in war in the Middle East. But we're not at war. But you know, they, they were getting into the cycle. <laughs> but you don't have to be at war to fall under letters of mark or the rules concerning the captures. Do you? Well, it because... says that they have the we gave them the power to declare war one to grant letters of mark and reprisal two and to make rules concerning captures on land and water three right the question though as we've come upon several times is how linked are those statements in the same phrase do they all flow from the same thing to declare war comma grant letters of mark and reprisal is that referring to war conditions it make wouldn't Make rules concerning captures on land and water referring to the war that's been declared. That would be something they'd have to interpret. Mm -hmm. I, I would think that it wouldn't for a couple of reasons. One, the use of the Oxford comma to separate them before the end. You know what, though? Right. I, think, I think David's absolutely right. When, when, because this is basically, we're, we're authorizing them to, to declare war. Everything after that, I believe, falls under the declare war. This, these aren't separate. These are not separate clauses. Right. And I think their structure, I think their structure at the time indicates that that's, that was the tendency when this was written. I think that's just my feeling. You would, you wouldn't have to have a war to have a letter of mark and reprisal. I would take the mark and reprisal out of it because it's not used anymore. Right. This was back when the constitution was written. This mark and reprisal is not used anymore. Right. And actually in the um, rugged constitution, 
there's an asterisk after that that specifically says this power was important when private citizens were permitted to capture enemy ships. It is no longer used. Right. So that's pretty much null and void now. Yeah, we, we can't imagine how important naval uh, battles and ships and shipping and piracy, all those things are something that's just far enough from our memory that we don't understand how big of a deal it was back then. It was a huge deal. And you know what? I was going to get into... Well, if you cut off somebody's trade route, that was a huge thing. I mean... Sure. That's right. That's a big deal. Yep. Well, well and you got you to remember back then, too, there was only one way to get troops somewhere, right? I mean, England was not going to send over airplanes and drop troops right. on the United States. The only way to get troops over here was to send them by ship. And Absolutely. Navy battles were... Yeah, yeah. decisive war war winning. As we're talking. What's it? I've been thinking about this as we're talking. You know, this is basically you know, written in the 1700s, and it's naval related. But you get into this now with with planes, and I, I'm thinking specifically like these little drones, right? Sure. Somebody gets a little drone to fly over here, like that's to me with some of the capabilities these drones have. I mean, oh, they could never imagine what we're, where yeah, we're gonna be. That's like one of those ships. You know, I, I was looking forward to getting into the army clause and the navy clause, um, but that's uh, the army clause more than the navy clause is gonna take some, uh, a little bit more discussion. Um, they were, there, there wasn't as much concern over the navy clause. Um, basically, we're, we're giving Congress the, the authority to, um, to raise and support armies and navies. Um, our founders were not nearly as concerned with the Navy as they were with the Army, right? Because it's the, the Army's, uh, uh, what was the quote? I love this quote. Um, Framers felt that armies were much more of a tool of tyrants, right? You weren't going to use the Navy um, if you were going to become a tyrant on your nation. I mean, so maybe the East Coast and the West Coast, but the Navy's not going to be able to do much. Standing armies were a big concern. So I would love to get into that. However, I think it's just going to be too much right now. Uh, so I'll probably start there next week and do Army and the Navy. Um, uh, well, you know what? That's I think that's probably a good place to stop anyway. I mean, we're at we're at nine o'clock, but we'll start with the army, the navy. We get into the military regulations after that, the militias. I mean, yeah. So we'll basically get into the way the military is set up, um, which could become a little something there. Can we I ask a silly, silly we question? Got sure. We got breaking news. Oh wait a minute! Breaking news. What? President Trump sends the COVID bill back to Congress and demands payments be increased from 600 to 2,000 per person. Oh, I heard also that. demands slashing of wasteful foreign aid. All right, Dan, stop talking. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this in the after party. The Stephanie, go ahead. What, what, what That's the lead in. <laughs> what you got, Stephanie? So I know we focus on this and we start breaking things down like piece by piece and and when you start taking things out of context and not really out of context, but when you start like breaking down meanings like word by word, I mean, I understand what we're doing. I know I don't have a problem with it, but like some of the stuff that we talk about that we focus on in our discussions, what might have been very, very relevant back then, like there's always like a time and a place for everything. Like, is it, like the whole thing you guys are just talking about, like the capturing of the land and the water and whatnot, like is, I mean, does that even participate or pertain, pertain to today? Sure it does. But you know what, what you're gonna do, what you're gonna have is, and I try to bring up the, the major court cases, but that's where, that's where these things get, um, you're gonna get the courts that are gonna decide what the constitution means as it applies to today. But of course, absolutely it does. Um, I mean, you look at, we're certainly taking war prizes, right, over in Afghanistan. I mean, um... yeah, if, I'm, if I may interject, Stephanie, I would say that uh, if we're going to really understand the Constitution, I think you have to begin, even if you have a uh, more uh, modern view of the Constitution, if you think it's a living document, I think you have to start with what did they mean? Yep. What did they intend? 
what was their what were they doing and why what was their universe like we have to have a little bit of that understanding if we're going to attempt to apply any of what they were doing to what we're doing now right. so, although, oh, no, i mean i get that and i understand i i get that apply, but they'll their their mindset will be helpful when we when we get to other areas where we have to interpret things we will have a better sense of what they were about. Well, I don't even think it's that the uh, mind I'm, I'm an originalist, right? I believe that the Constitution means what the Constitution says. As, unless, as do I. As unless do there's I. an amendment that changes that, I believe that the Constitution means what it says. Now, you're going to have case law both ways. You're going to have case law that's great for us, and you're going to have case law that's activist and horrible for us. But right. yep. the Constitution as written is written. I, I just, you know, it's the captures clause and maybe I'm wrong here, but you know, things like Iraq, uh, when we go storming in there and we seize an air base and we start using that air base for us, I believe that probably falls under the captures clause. Right. I agree. Uh, I concur. Yeah, no, that's I think fine. I, I understand <clears throat> that. And, and I appreciate all the discussion and, and I guess sometime I don't even know if I'm going to even say this right. Like sometimes I think we get so bogged down on like words that it's like trying to apply it to today. I, I don't so know. Sometimes I feel like we go off track or off think? like on a tangent. Do you, are you an originalist of the constitution or do you believe it is, it's living and breathing? And there's no wrong answer. He may not know. I believe that the constitution was written for this country and I think that's why laws are written as they are and amendments are done because it's like, okay, well, what happened then doesn't apply to now. Like, well, there's a difference. Know, we're not at war with our, ourselves. And I get that things change and that they evolve. I'm just trying to, I mean, I, here, here again, I'm number one on this list. So I'm, I'm your person that doesn't know anything and I'm starting from scratch. So I'm trying, I mean, it, it is a lot overload and I understand but I was there's, late tonight. Hold on. Like, there's a difference in amendments and laws for sure. You can't, you can't equate the two right? An amendment, right. I'm, all, I'm all about it. If we go about it right and we amend the Constitution, okay. But laws, okay. laws don't always supersede the Constitution, right? Some of these gun laws are unconstitutional. Yeah. So you can't take laws. Um, I understand that laws are laws and they got to be followed, but there's, there is certainly room to fight a lot of these laws. There's not a whole lot of room to fight amendments. Stephanie, I understand your frustration. It does seem sometimes to get uh, pedantic and we get bogged down in one sentence with a couple of words. Uh, but I think where we do that, for the most part, it's usually critical to understanding of what they meant when they wrote it. And I think even if you're a, uh, a person that believes in the constitution as being a living, breathing document, you still have to start in an originalist uh, mindset with what they, what they had what their beliefs were, what their life was like. So, but I do understand it does, it can be a little overwhelming when we get definitions out of 1755 dictionaries. I would just encourage you to bear with us. Oh, no, no. Oh, yeah. And I come in here and I do listen. And so a lot of times I don't talk because I'm listening and, and I appreciate the people who are way smarter than me, Jim. Thank you. Uh, and Brad. Uh, listen, and I'm just a dumb guy with internet access. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm just a guy that likes to talk that has internet access that's all I'm, yeah, so, so um, i do understand i'm coming from ground zero i have a lot to yeah. learn and sure. so a lot of times i don't say anything but sometimes you guys get to the conversations that like supersede like my like knowledge and i well, just then, like you know, wow then that's when you should chime in because sometimes if we go over if we're going over your head we're going over somebody else's head <laughs> And then everybody is just sitting there like, what the hell are these assholes talking about? I'm sorry. What the hell are these are we recording? So stop, us. stop us and be like, whoa, 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 fellas. Hey, Jim. Yeah. I felt like for the eight years of President Obama, he held that document up and said, well, this gives us a list of what we can't do, but it doesn't say what I can do. And I'm just going to try to keep throwing shit at the wall and see if it sticks and oh, skirt oh, yeah. around and do it you know what i mean and that, that was that was a real thing that was happening where he almost felt like it was a breathing document but he was also like sub, like trying to subvert it a little bit and that is in my 100%, opinion that is 100 wrong 
right? It tells, it doesn't tell them what they can't do. It tells them what they can do. That's it. Or well, we'll switch it around then. You know, I mean, he sat there well, and no, said, no, I get what you're saying, but that's it. But if it's yeah. not in there, they can't do it. There's no, it doesn't tell us we can't. Yes, it does. Because <laughs> if it doesn't say it, you can't do it. That's it. End of story. Yeah, yeah but he, he, he thought a different line about that. Well, he I know, thought, you know. Well, I'm going to do this, well, and then you got to find out yeah. where it's wrong. I don't yeah. We got to go. Renee, are you going to set up this, try to get your video working and set up this other room? Yeah, I'll do it on my phone. I, I can I can do that on my phone. Renee, All I see is your senior. Renee, I, senior, see, senior. I see two of you, Renee. One of the videos is perfectly fine. The other one is just a still. Right. The other one's my phone so that we can. Ah, so okay. And the other one's your senior picture. Your senior picture. That's that's what what I'm you know what? Now that you say that, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get my senior picture. I'm gonna make a photo. Everyone will know you were everyone will know you're a dork. All right. See see you guys. Mini blinds. Yeah. All right. So we are out. We will see you guys. If you guys want to come to the after, we'll come to the after. We'll talk about the uh, about COVID relief bill a little bit. You you posting that on Facebook? Yeah, Renee will have it. Um, Renee, are you going to put a different link up? Or, no, well, it's always the same link. Always the same post link. Can you just put another post up so it's easy to find? I sure can. All right. And I'll make and, sure you put it on the Everyday Constitution page. Yeah, don't put it on your page. <laughs> you put yeah, it on her sorry, page. Guys. That's, That's what I did last time. All okay. right, I'll see you guys all over all right. there in a minute. See you in a bit. Bye. Bye, guys.